Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and you join me from the Queen's House in Greenwich. And I wanted to start our documentary on Queen Elizabeth I off with possibly what is the most famous portrait of Queen Elizabeth I, the Armada portrait. This portrait was painted and depicts possibly the greatest moment of Queen Elizabeth's life, the victory over the Spanish Armada. And that was one of the things that made the Queen, along with her speech, which she gave at the Armada, which we'll hear a little bit more about, but some of that is, though I may have the body of a weak and feeble woman, I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. So, this is Queen Elizabeth I, and of course we must start our documentary off with the starting of her dynasty, which began with this man, King Henry VII, Queen Elizabeth I's grandfather. His battle at Bosworth Field and his victory over King Richard III is what got the Tudors onto the English throne. And then onto Elizabeth's father, King Henry VIII here. We all know about old Harry VIII, the six wives of King Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, one of them being Queen Elizabeth I's mother. Now, the ill-fated Anne Boleyn, we all know what happened to her. Queen Elizabeth I very rarely spoke about her mother, for understandable reasons, but she wore a ring for many years of her life, as a a two tiny images in, one of Queen Elizabeth I and one of her mother. So that's a little bit of a, a hint as to how she may have felt about her mother. This young man is King Edward VI, Queen Elizabeth I's brother. And in the law of primogeniture in those days, they was younger than her and her older sister Mary. When their father died, being a boy, it was Edward the heir that came to the throne. Edward's ill-fated reign didn't last very long. He died at the age of 15 um, of consumption. And a lot of people died in his reign because he was an ardent Protestant and sent many, many people to their deaths. And here you see Queen Mary, or Bloody Mary, and um, her husband, King Philip of Spain. They came after King Edward. And uh, Queen Mary was not a very well-liked woman. She burned hundreds of people in her reign at Smithfield. And that's where I was the other day when I went through the gatehouse. And uh, the, the rumour is that she used to sit there and watch the, the heretics burn, but that's probably just an old wives' tale. But it's a little bit of a gist as to how hated she became. Not just because of uh, the burnings, but because she married a Spaniard. In those days, when a woman married, whatever was hers became her husband's. And England did not want to become a vassal of Spain. So Mary reigned for a time, and two phantom pregnancies later, uh, they believe she died of stomach cancer. A very unloved and very unhappy woman. And there we are with Queen Elizabeth I herself. And after the death of her sister, you had the ill-fated nine days queen of uh, Jane Grey in the meantime of that when Edward died. And uh, she didn't last long, poor girl, and then she was executed. Mary came to the throne, and after Mary came our subject for today, Queen Elizabeth I. What you're looking at here is Greenwich Palace, also known as the Palace of Placentia. And this is where Queen Elizabeth I was born. The palace no longer exists. The memory of Queen Elizabeth I certainly does. Here's another slightly later image showing the palace and the Thames. Although later than Elizabeth's age, this would have been very much recognisable to her. And that's where the life of Queen Elizabeth I, our subject for today, began. So on to the next part of our documentary. So with a father like King Henry VIII, who many in his reign called a monster, and some still do. The artist, along with Cromwell of the Reformation. Six wives. The tableau of Henry VIII's wives goes divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. And the survivor, the great survivor, was his last wife, Catherine Parr. 
and an executed mother, and Berlin, who we're seeing here, who pretty much everyone knows that she was innocent. Even then, Henry VIII couldn't get a boy out of her and he wanted another wife, so the trumped up charges of treason, adultery, incest with her own brother, witchcraft, that all saw to the end of Anne Boleyn. When King Henry VIII was courting Anne Boleyn and they were to marry and she was to be crowned, she arrived at the Tower of London where all monarchs stayed before their coronation in those days and he greeted her at the royal gate and swore at that gate that he would love her forever. Sadly for Elizabeth and for Anne that love didn't last forever and we all know the way that story went. The main problem was for Henry that Anne couldn't give him a son, but also as well Anne, very much like her daughter, was tenacious and she didn't keep her mouth shut. And that was not a good thing to be around Henry VIII in those days because he didn't take kindly to being answered back to or particularly to being mocked, which is what she and her brother did. And that cost them both their lives. When Elizabeth was born, in 1533, her sister Mary, the child of King Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, who had been put aside for Anne Boleyn, was put aside from her place as a princess and became My Lady Mary. When Elizabeth was born, she became the heiress presumptive to the throne. So her starting in life was a very, very great one, as it seemed, and for a little while it seemed it would go on that way. Elizabeth as a later young woman, adult, didn't speak that much about her parents and it's quite understandable why. But like has happened to Catherine of Aragon before her, who Anne Boleyn did gleefully overthrow, we must admit, Anne was overthrown as well, for the same reason that she couldn't give Henry a boy. Jane Seymour, the only woman that would give Henry VIII a legitimate son. Uh, when Anne was put aside and the marriage was annulled and she was executed, Elizabeth went from being a princess, an heir presumptive, to being like her sister, merely my Lady Elizabeth. And the rumoured bastard of the king, and some didn't, some even said, and the king kind of at first went along with this, that Elizabeth wasn't even his daughter that she was the daughter of Mark Smeaton, who is the music master of uh, Anne Boleyn. Uh, after a while, uh, Henry VIII obviously called in time and over time, but this is a good image here because it shows it's the royal family. You've got Henry VIII in the middle with Jane Seymour, his wife, and his heir, the son, which would, who would take the throne. The two ladies on either side Literally in the shadows, to the left is Mary, who would become Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, and to the right is Elizabeth. This picture literally speaks a thousand words because it shows that they were thrown into the shadows. I mean, they were educated and stuff, but particularly for Elizabeth, her life became quite hard when her mother died because the king didn't want nothing to do with her. Her governess had to send begging letters and everything for allowances for cloth for her dresses and stuff like that. And Mary certainly didn't fare any better when her mother was put aside because Mary would, like her mother, would not acknowledge the king as head of the church and would not acknowledge that her mother and father's marriage had been illegitimate. So you didn't defy Henry VIII and get away with it. So he made her life an absolute mis living misery until she gave in and signed the declaration a thing for which she never ever forgave herself. It was Jane Seymour and really Catherine Parr that made the king call towards his daughters and really Catherine Parr it is rumoured that she was the guiding hand behind the girls being retitled and acknowledged as the king's daughters again which later on happened. Though Elizabeth didn't speak about her mother that much. She wore a ring all her life, which was taken off of her finger upon death. A locket ring, and when opened, 
It's in the museum and I've shown it on my pages before, but when opened, inside are two tiny miniatures, one of the Queen herself and one of Anne Boleyn. So that gives us a little gist to, as to how she felt about her mother. Her mother was executed as a traitor, rumoured as a witch and a whore. Elizabeth's early life after that, she'd been rumoured a bastard, illegitimate, in, out, in, out. So when she eventually did get acknowledged as a royal princess again, and eventually came to the throne, you can well understand why she didn't speak about her mother. But you can understand, or get a gist of what her feelings must have been towards her parents. I mean, she is rumoured to, and, and did say that she loved her father. Her mother she may barely have remembered. But you can imagine, with a father like Henry VIII, a very terrifying figure, how her childhood would have panned out. Henry VIII died in 1547, leaving the throne to Queen Elizabeth's brother, the young Edward that we see there to his left. Edward's reign was a short and very brutal one. Like his father, he was very, very opinionated and would not budge in his opinions. He was an ultra-Orthodox Protestant. It was really under his reign as well that the churches were stripped of any last remaining vestiges of Catholicism, such as stained glass and the decorative stuff, and they were painted white, and we had the plain communion tables, which really gave us the Church of England that we kind of see today. But as I say, Edward's reign, reign was not long. Come 1516, he was dying of consumption. Edward knew he was dying, and he was terrified, obviously, of death, but also what would become of the throne and of his legacy. His heir was Mary, over to the, right, over to the left, an ultra-Orthodox Catholic. Everything that he was against, everything that he was against. His younger heir was Elizabeth, a Protestant, it's true, but rumoured to be a whore because of all what happened with Seymour, which we'll, we'll find out more about. His choice for the throne became Jane Grey, the Nine Days Queen. Hers is the sh quite probably the shortest reign that this country's ever seen. She didn't really want to be queen. She was forced to it by her parents and her mother and father-in-law, who were all power hungry and all wanted the throne. Anyway, she was nine days queen. That was overthrown quickly. And we gained Mary the First of England, Mary Tudor, also known as Bloody Mary, because of the excessive amounts of burnings that occurred in her reign and executions of all kinds. One of her favored bishops, Bloody Bishop Bonner, there's another one who had the bloody tableau put to him. Between them, they had a lot of who they labeled heretics burned. Mary was a double-edged sword, a double-sided coin. To those who were loyal to her and who she loved, she was the most loyal and kind protector you could wish to meet. To those who went against her, and particularly her faith, well, anyone that's seen my videos around the Smithfield and St Bartholomew's area, and the Smithfield burnings, that's basically where she went. What really undone her and ruined her though, really, her reputation and any respect for the people had for her, because there was respect and loyalty at first, was her marriage to King Philip of Spain. As I've said before in other videos and anything to do with that time, when a woman married, even a queen, whatever she had became her husband's. And the English did not want their country becoming the property or a vassal of Spain. The English blamed Philip for Mary's ardent feelings towards non-conformists and those who would not toe the line. It wasn't really him. Even he tried to stop her, realising that she was destroying their reputation, utterly destroying it. But she was a religious zealot and a religious reformist, so that was the way she went. Another fairly short reign, um, in a way, not being unkind, it was probably a good thing because had she reigned for a longer time, the damage that she would have caused was, would cause, well, dread to think. But yeah, that's the uh, the siblings of Queen Elizabeth I covered, which in a little while will be leading us on to her own reign. But now, 
on to some of the key figures of her early life. And now on to those people with whom Queen Elizabeth formed some of her strongest bonds, some in her early years and one or two in the latter years. First is Catherine, Cat Ashley, was the first close female friend and governess to Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I really wasn't a woman's woman, she got on a lot better with men. So she didn't have very many female friends, but Cat Ashley was a lifelong one and very loyal to, they were very loyal to each other. And here we see an image of Cat Ashley. Blanche Parry was someone with whom Queen Elizabeth formed really, really close ties and a close bond and she was absolutely devastated when she died. Um, she was with Elizabeth from her younger years, a lifelong servant, which became a friendship. She rose to the rank of Chief Gentlewoman to the Queen, plus quick Keeper of the Queen's Jewels, which was a high-ranking position in those days, and made you, in a, in a way, of high status, because you were close to the Queen and you had the Queen's ear, so it made you a popular person with people wanting favours. You could earn a few bob or two like that as well. And here we see Blanche Parry. Catherine Parr, the last wife of Henry VIII, a very interesting woman and renowned to be a very kind woman as well. And she was the sixth wife of Henry VIII, stepmother to Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth's brother, his uncle, Thomas Seymour. Basically, him and Catherine Parr had had a friendship kind of relationship before Henry VIII set his eye on Catherine Parr. Anyway, once Henry VIII set his eye on Catherine Parr, Thomas Seymour had to go out the window and he was sent on a faraway diplomatic mission to get rid of him. Anyway, so she married Henry VIII and luckily outlived him, which she barely did by the skin of her teeth, because she was a Protestant and a couple of the Catholics wanted rid of her. But when, she, when Henry VIII died, Catherine Parr married Thomas Seymour, some say with shocking haste. It caused quite a bit of shock at the time. Catherine and Elizabeth were very close, and when the king died, Elizabeth was sent to Catherine's household to live with her. Unfortunately, Catherine's kindness to Elizabeth caused a bit of a problem, because when Catherine married Thomas Seymour, Catherine, who'd always been married to old men, she'd had three husbands, one of them including the king, all older than herself and mostly all infirm, and she'd never had children, so it is rumoured that even she believed herself to be barren. Anyway, after years of never bearing a child, marrying Seymour, she got pregnant. While she was pregnant, Seymour began a really inappropriate relationship towards Elizabeth, bearing in mind that he was in a grown man, an adult man, and she was a, in a young teenage girl. But we'll hear a little more of that in a minute. Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, made Earl of Leicester by Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth had favourites, and he was her ultimate favourite. Some say that they were lovers, but their friendship was formed when Elizabeth was imprisoned in the Tower under the reign of her sister Queen Mary. Mary wanted rid of Elizabeth, and if she could have, she would have had her executed. But Elizabeth's name was rumoured and put to several plots, Protestant plots, to overthrow the Catholic Queen Mary, so Elizabeth was imprisoned in the Tower. Dudley was also imprisoned in the Tower. His father and brother had been executed for the plot of trying to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne. And it's at this time that Elizabeth and Dudley formed a lifelong friendship. Some say they were lovers, but she always called him a best friend and brother. And once when someone insulted him, she really rounded on him and, and had a go and said, well, when others left me to rot in the tower and such like, this, this man sold a good piece of land to aid me. So that's Robert Dudley. And upon his death, she really was devastated absolutely devastated. His last letter to her that he wrote while he was dying 
It was found in a box by her bed when she died and she'd inscribed on it his last letter. And her last great friendship, or with a male favourite, was Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex. Dudley, who we've just seen, married Lettice Nollies, who was the, this young man's mother. So Dudley, who we've just seen, became his stepfather. Anyway, when Robert Dudley died, this boy was put forward. And some say that the Queen favoured him so much and she, she forgave him a lot. She forgave him a hell of a lot. Because he was her last link to Robert Dudley. The Queen grew old in an age where many people didn't live to the age of 69 or 70 and she lost all her favourites and friends around her and this young man was a link to that greatest and most loved of favourites. Unfortunately he took liberty after liberty and got involved in something called the Babington plot and such like and other plots and yeah in the end she had to have him executed and even he admitted that the Queen had no choice but to have him executed in the end because she wouldn't be safe while he lived even he said that but back to Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour and the unfortunate events that took place at Sudley Castle while Elizabeth was under her care so join me for that part of the video you're looking at Thomas Seymour first Baron Sudley who is uncle to King Edward, Queen Elizabeth's, the brother, Queen Elizabeth's brother. When Henry VIII died, his widow, Catherine Parr, her and this man, Thomas, they'd been rumoured as lovers, had a bond beforehand, and he wanted to marry her before she married Henry VIII. And then Henry VIII set his eye on her, and no one dared say no to Henry VIII. This man was sent off on a diplomatic mission to get him out of the way, and Catherine spent her time living in fear, married to the, by this time, bloated and terrifying King Henry VIII. And when he died, she was free, and she married Thomas Seymour. Sudley Castle, where they lived, which is where we pick up with Elizabeth, who went to stay with her stepmother who she absolutely loved she she really did love Catherine Parr Catherine Parr had always been married to old men and had never born a child and she even believed herself to be barren but after many years of never having born a child she became pregnant by Thomas here while she was pregnant Thomas set his eye on the young Elizabeth a very young teenage girl bearing in mind this is a man in a grown man and it became very bad that the things that he was getting up to servant I mean Mrs Astley Elizabeth's servant complained because it got so bad at one point even Catherine you know, the ex-queen was in on it a little bit not with the abuse but her and Seymour she held Elizabeth while Seymour cut Elizabeth's dress to ribbons and Elizabeth's uh, governess was not pleased about that because it was a good dress of best black silk made for mourning the queen, the, uh, the late king, Henry VIII. So yeah, and the liaisons between this individual and Queen Elizabeth I got so bad and Catherine, the stepmother and his wife, found out in the end when she came into the room and came upon him and Elizabeth, or him trying to do things with Elizabeth that he should, no, no grown man should be trying to do with a teenage girl. Anyway, Elizabeth was sent away, much to her grief, because she loved Catherine. But yeah, he's a creepy fellow, this one, and he ended up paying his dues at the, at the block on Tower Hill. So, yeah, that's uh, a little bit of Elizabeth's youth, which, with a father like Henry VIII, a mother having gone to the block, an abusive stepfather, you can... <sighs> You can well imagine why Queen Elizabeth I did not want to marry. Because as we spoke about, talking about Elizabeth's sister, when a woman married in those days, what she had became her husband's. And even some like Lord Robert, who was more like a brother to Elizabeth, some say they were lovers. But I don't know about that. And 
he would try his luck with a little bit of authority here and there and she would put him rightly in his place and say I will have but one mistress and no master and her courtiers, her lords, a pretty council, they tried everything to get her to marry because they wanted her to have an heir. But she did not want to marry and marry she didn't. So on to the next part of our documentary. Well that concludes part one of the life of Queen Elizabeth I, which was her birth and early years and childhood and the traumas that went along with it. She may have been royal born, as we've seen with a father like Henry VIII and the way things went with her early years, it wasn't always that pleasant or that easy for her. So please join me again for part two, where we'll see from prison to palace, which was something she always offered up prayers to God for delivering her from prison to palace. So join me again soon for part two.